Anybody got the ball out? Somebody say something so I can see if I can hear you. Something so I can hear you. <clears throat> say something so I can hear you. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> can you hear me okay? I can. <laughs> I Thank can. You, Jesus. All right. So listen, same format as always. Where am I at? Am I on the big screen? Both. Both screens. Yep, yep, you are. Tell them okay. in the mic. Yeah, tell them, yeah. Same format as always. You guys just, if you got a question, let's go for it. But we're going to talk again today about this second installment of time. And I'm, I'm excited about I'm excited about doing it. <clears throat> but last week, uh, I think Tim asked the question about who, uh, you know, why were we talking about this? And so I've included in my... Uh, in, in my thinking, the fact that we need to review these things a little bit. So, Riley, I'm going to get ready to share screen. Okay, uh, yeah, I think we're okay code. with that, probably. And I'm going to pop this up and grab this and share it and start it. Wow. Let's see. Okay, can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Give me a wave or something if you can. Yeah, we're good. Well, this, we're going to look at our uh, at the time thing again. And we were back here talking at theology, and there was an amazing point that was made on the last session. And it was that we have a choice of looking at time as either coming up from behind us or coming from in front of us. And if it's coming from in front of us, it brings stuff to us. And if we're coming from in the future, and the opportunities and potential of time are focused on. And if we think about time coming from behind us, it's going to end up constantly looking like something that we've either missed or we're going to be focused on the past. So I don't know that we'll get all the way to that point yet, but it's something I want you guys to think about. What I do want to look at is the review of why are we doing this again? Because, again, Tim reminded me last week that, that it's important that people know the why. And so... What can suppress our voice? We're trying to find a voice. I'm back here with a bunch of people who are tr struggling to do exactly the same thing. They know that the Lord lives inside them. They know that he has things to say. And they absolutely want to find that voice. And so we're thinking here, what is it that creates insecurity regarding hearts towards us? If you remember the first time we looked at how should we think about our hearts and can we trust his voice? And the second time, what is the wrath of God? So, here was the, the premise that I want us to work on. Fearful, insecure people either yell or shut down and clam up. Secure sons speak boldly from their father's love and acceptance. You need to be able to speak to yourself boldly. But as much or more than you need that, the world needs us to be able to speak to them boldly. Boldly about the acceptance of God. Boldly about love. Because there are loud voices Maybe not bold, but loud. They're telling them that they don't measure up. They're telling them that uh, they, they sin too frequently, too often. They do it too much again when they think they're over with it. And the Holy Spirit is looking for people who realize that that's not true. So we choose to repent from being silenced by a poor thinking. In the area of our heart, yes, my heart can still harbor darkness but it also has the capacity to be a home to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus. And this is a treasure that I won't waste. So last week we started this, and I really like this. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like you to, to uh, stand up and say this with me. All right, you must have heard me because I see you standing up. <laughs> so we're going to say, yes, my heart can still harbor darkness, but it also has the capacity to be a home to the Holy Spirit, Jesus. Yes, my heart can still harbor darkness, but it also has the capacity to be a home to Holy Spirit and Jesus. That is a treasure I won't waste. Therefore, I choose to be open to trust God's voice speaking from my heart. We got to work on that one, baby. Yeah, how did that go? Did it work? Mostly. Not too bad. All right, let's do the next one. We've talked about God's wrath. 
So let's just say this. God's wrath isn't fun or trivial. But it flows from his love. And it's powerful to protect my destiny. And it's powerful to protect my destiny. And place in his eternal presence. And place in his eternal presence. Therefore, Father, Therefore, Father, I humbly welcome your wrath. I humbly welcome your wrath. For the protection it is. For the protection it is. Okay, that one still feels weird. But <laughs> I think we I think we're on solid ground, guys. I do. All right, so now we're gonna look at um, what's going on regarding time. And uh, I just want you to consider, you know, last week we talked about how a negative view of time, an impersonal view of time, makes, makes us have statements like, I'm running out of time, or time waits for no man. But this phrase is another one about time that circulates in our culture, that time heals all wounds. Um, and so I just want us to consider that, that there may be some, some truth behind that, at least as a jumping off point. Here's our key scripture. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world, or in the New American Standard, it's the ages. This caught me off guard, as you know, we talked about last week when we with this scripture, and I was excited about this concept of the ages. So I want to talk a little bit more about this. Here's, here's Young's uh, literal. It has a little bit less uh, figurative re rendering, as you know. And I got excited about it because it just makes it clear. In many parts, in many ways, God of old, having spoken to the fathers in the prophets, in these last days did speak to us in a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also did make the ages. So that's the thing that we're, we're going to concentrate on, is what is the significance of this idea that Jesus made the ages? But come here just a sec. All right, so here's Mark Derniak. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. There, there. How y'all doing? Hi. Hi. We were so blessed to have Larry with us today and all weekend. And I just want to tell you, we took good care of him. We love him. And I hope you guys realize how blessed you are to have this man in your lives. We love him. Amen. Amen. It was a great Amen. I just, they, they just, everybody prayed for me. And the stuff that they sent home with me is going to be amazing, guys. So it's, it's really cool. All right. Have fun. We love you. Bye. Thank you so much. Okay. So what are the implications of this? <clears throat> Point number one is that time was made by God through Jesus the Son. Time was made by God through Jesus the Son. So let me take a second. I'm going to switch back over here so I can see you guys a little bit bigger. We'll come back to that. If I can do that here. How do I do that? Uh, stop sharing. Yeah. And then let me go to you guys. I am learning right here as we speak. So let's make this full screen again. There we go. Okay, the implications of this work against thought that I think a lot of people probably sort of hold naturally, and that is that time sort of sprang into existence as a necessity when the worlds were made. Because then all of a sudden you had matter, or you had this idea of there was a, a rotation of the, of the earth, or you had an idea of darkness and light, and so the evening and the morning were the first day. And all, at least that's how I thought about it all my life. I, I thought time was sort of an impersonal, cosmic necessity because now you have two things or more in motion against one another, and time is what measures that motion. I'm not sure that there's, there's not truth. If you remember that verse or that uh, definition, that's kind of how it was described publicly. We'll get to that a little bit later in, in the PowerPoint. But... Um, I think what the Lord's revealing to us and what he's asking us to change our thinking about is that it's very, very different if time is an impersonal force or if time is a personally created aspect, a personally created gift. And so that's kind of what I want us to think about today. And so the first thing that I think is undeniable if we uh, uh, consider, you know, the fact what this verse says is that time is a created event. And we're going to look at it right here. So point one is that time was made by God through Jesus the Son. So not only is this revelation going to set us free a little bit from that 
impersonal juggernaut of time that just sort of grinds through uh, day after day creation. And, and we don't really have any influence. We don't have any, there's nothing personal. There's nothing purposeful about time. It just keeps going. It just keeps going. The implications are a little bit different if you take into account that God was, that, that time was made by God. So let's see what's going on here. There we go. So from this, here's the first thing. Time was made. Time didn't happen as a byproduct of creation. Time was made intentionally, on purpose, and for a purpose. So I know that when people are going through hard times or when promises are stalled off for a long time or something, we have a tendency to think that time is just this impersonal force and it's not on our side. And next week we're going to be in a position, I hope, to at a moment's notice get, get the uh, Rolling Stones singing, time is on our side. Because it's a revelation that, that's real and it changes how we go. So it's not just a byproduct, but it's literally something that was specifically created and it flows from the Father's intention. It's not just a, a randomly created thing. It's something that the Father intentionally chose to create. And that means that it comes out of who he is. We've spent a lot of time studying about that God is love is love, is light, is spirit, and is fire that consumes. That's who God is. And so time, because God chose to make it, it it's something that comes out from him. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not a byproduct of the motion of the planets. It is a product of the heart of the Father, the life of the Father, the love of the Father. When you start thinking about that, then you go, wow, well, time can, time can make, it has something to do with love. It has something to do with life. It has something to do with spirit. And it has something to do with that fire that consumes those four things that we learned a long time ago that are God. It's, the Bible says God is. Okay? So time's purpose and function can best be understood within who we trust and enjoy and about what we trust and enjoy about God in his nature. So I want you to start thinking, and I don't think we have to think about time as like a personal thing. Like, you know, the Bible talks about wisdom and personifies it as a woman. And if you've watched like the shack, you see that wisdom was this lady that was confronting him. I don't know. I'm not saying that time doesn't have a personal embodiment of some sort. Uh, you know, it talks about the stars sing and, and uh, the morning sun uh, speaks and all these sorts of things. But, so I don't think we have to go that far, but what I do have to think is that everything that time is came out of the love of God, the light of God, the spirit of God, and the fire of God. So I start thinking about things that happen. Uh, scripture, it's, a, uh, it's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Well, that speaks about a time of appointment in our life, but the, 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 the whole idea of dying and, and, and then being judged is going to be involved in underneath the, underneath the expression of, in the context of, the love, light, spirit, and fire that God is. So if, if that makes sense, wave to me, because I got a little tiny picture of you guys on the screen over here. All right, all right, well, it made sense to somebody. I saw somebody's hand wave. Awesome. So that means that, that we don't need to uh, be any more afraid of time than we're afraid of God. It doesn't mean that we need to be any more leery of time than we are distrustful of God. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'll remind you that when the Lord asked me to teach this session on time, as one of the five essential things we have to change our thinking about if we're going to get to know who, uh, who God is and find our voice in the kingdom, uh, he said, you see time like an enemy that you have to resist or overcome, and I see time like an ally, and I'd like you to see time like I do. So that's kind of why we're taking a look at this, and this is the first step of it. God sees time as a servant. God sees time as something that houses and promotes his nature of love and light. God sees something of time that works in the relationship with his purposes, and that's going to come up here in just a sec. So this, we also learn from this that time was made through Jesus. Time wasn't just randomly created. Time was made through Jesus. That's what the scripture says. Who also, through whom also I made the ages. He made the ages. So now Jesus is Father's Son, and he's our Savior. He's the nexus between that. He's, he's the incarnate one who came and took on sinful flesh but didn't have any sin of his own. He's the one that went and walked and talked to reveal the Father's nature. 
to restore our ability to understand who the Father was. And, and then Jesus was the one who went to the cross. He's the one that sacrificed his life so that we could be forgiven, sacrificed his life, went into the grave, rose from the grave so that we could participate in his death and resurrection and really live, live in relationship with God. And if you remember, Jesus is the one that also said in, in uh, some of our favorite verses anyway, uh, John 14, 20, that in that day, after the Holy Spirit's poured out, when they, and he's living in you and, and with you, you're going to know, you're going to know that I am in my Father. So the fact that time was created through Jesus, who is within his Father, also adds to the reality that time is something that literally flows from the most intimate places of God. It flows from the heart of God. It's not an impersonal personal force. It's not something that God just pointed and whipped up out in some sector of space. It is something that literally flows from his heart. And I, I think as we move forward in this a little bit, that's going to get kind of important. It also means that specifically the scripture says it was made through Jesus. And that takes not just the attributes of God's love and light and spirit and fire. It takes the attributes that were manifest in Jesus and makes them a part of time. So here goes. Time shares not only in the nature of God, but in the mission and the motive of Jesus. Time is a part of redemption. When I saw that, I started thinking, okay, I can see some powerful implications into that. Because time is the thing that creates second chances. Time is the thing that creates the opportunity for you to hear a message. Because think about it. If time didn't exist, there'd be nothing to hear because there'd be no one moment after another. We talked a little bit about that last week. That's not just an abstract concept. That's a real truth. God made time. Or let's say uh, that you suffered a loss. Family member, a spouse, or something. Uh, time gives you time to grieve that. It gives you time to process it. Or let's say that you've got something new. We just, uh, my family just had uh, a new baby, uh, niece, for me, born yesterday, I think, yesterday about 7 o'clock. Time gives that child a chance to grow up, to become an adult, to experience life, to get to know God, to be loved by parents. Time gives uh, Kaylee and Brian the opportunity to, to grow as people now that they're parents, to understand what it's like to have somebody so big in your heart that uh, it, it changes the way you think about almost everything. Time is an is a amazing gift when you think about it that way. And then when you consider that it not only shares the, the, the loving heart of God and the light-giving capacity of God's nature and the, the, the purifying nature of God's fire and uh, the liberating nature. Remember it says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The fact that God is spirit and that time comes out of that is participating in our liberty. It's participating. In, and you can just think about that even in our own country. Uh, there was a, a, a movement for freedom, a movement for a revolutionary war. And, you know, you don't necessarily think of time in that situation, but it took time. And it took junctures in time. It took Kairos moments in time. It took the Kronos flow of time. And, and, and it produced an age. or It was recognized as an age. And the same thing goes about learning and science and, and the gospel. At the appointed time, Christ came. At the appointed time, there was a birth in Bethlehem. And so uh, time shares by being created and by being created specifically through Jesus, it shares in the purpose of, of the coming of Emmanuel. It shares in the purpose of Jesus. We're going to be celebrating Christmas. And whether we're in the right holiday or not is not at all the, the issue to me. At an appointed time, a child was born. And all of the circumstances lined up in time. The census uh, from Caesar Augustus, everything led to that moment. And that moment was punctuated by the announcement by the angels that God's been looking for this for a long time. And he's blessing you people in, in whom he's pleased. So this idea, the therefore behind that, is that from God, we can expect time to be an ally of and to manifest love, light, spirit, and fire in our lives. And through Jesus, we can expect time to be associated with inclusion. He, uh, he, he was sent to, into the whole world. He was given to the whole world. The spirit was poured out on all flesh. In other words, the redemptive purposes of the Father were expressed through Jesus 
for everybody. Now, do we have to believe it? I absolutely believe so. But that doesn't take away the fact that there's an inclusive element that time now does. Time is giving the nations a chance to respond, a nation, the nations a chance to learn. And it's giving the individuals a chance to respond and to learn and to know God. So it's associated with inclusion and certainly forgiveness. You know, Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness uh, of, of everybody, actually. Uh, and, and whether it's a provision or whether it's an application, time is necessary to let that work of the cross touch people's lives. And that's why I think it's kind of cool. And then I'm going to get to the end of this slide, and then we'll see if there's any questions. Through Jesus, we, uh, we also realize that time now is a part of the program of redemption. Like, how would we pray for people that don't yet believe in the Lord if we didn't have time? Time gives us an opportunity. And, of course, for salvation. And then if I, I, I want to point out that the word for salvation is sozo. And sozo means healing. So I reflect back on that little cultural statement that we make, or we're examining. Does time heal all wounds? Well, for a person to get saved, time does heal all wounds. Time played a major role in the healing of a person who is saved. And so I, I, I want us to think about it that way. So now let me take a, take a, a quick uh, question. I'm going to stop sharing just for a second. The screen. And I am going to see if you guys have any questions. Let me continue over here. Any questions? Any thoughts? Anything anybody wants to add? Hey, Greg. Hey. Abby was too short for me to see when that was just a thumbnail on the side of the screen. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Awesome. Nice beard, Kevin. It's coming along. <laughs> Sonny looks good. Any questions? No? Does it make sense? How's this thing working? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Good. Do I need makeup? Yeah. <laughs> you know, one thing Larry I was saying, I was just talking to Riley about was uh, it'd be cool because your window is really tiny in the bottom corner of the screen. It'd be really cool if we could figure out a way to make it bigger. So even if it's totally overlaying awesome. some of what you're saying, uh -huh. um, but that's just like the one tiny tweak that I think we could improve on. Okay, am I full screen on the picture right now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So that's All looking right. pretty good. It's a lot easier to engage when you're a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's the same way I feel. Like I bet you guys have full screen, and, and I, I feel like I'm there. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll spend a little less time on the uh, a little less time on the screen share. But let me switch back there for a second. I want to introduce our next point, and I'll see if I can I can go the other way. Thanks. So cool. Okay. So we're going to contrast this, and I will do. I'll run through this kind of quick. We're going to contrast it with the definition that we read from uh, both Google, that time is an impersonal kind of indiscriminate force of nature. Uh, and um, let's look at the next one here. So here are our definitions. The indefinite continued progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as a whole. See what I mean about the impersonal nature of it? And then on the biblical side, uh, we looked at this one from that Baker Theological Dictionary. It is debatable whether the Bible contains enough information to formulate a full-scale doctrine of time. Nonetheless, the significance of the Bible concept of time is unmistakably the way it uniformly presents God at work in guiding the course of history. Now listen, I really commend them for that definition of it, the way it presents God at work in guiding the course of history. But I do think there's enough to, to not so much form a, a doctrine about time, but I think it's, it's, it's more about realizing that time literally is on our side. Time literally is on our side. Time really is an, a, a gift of the Father. So this thing that Harold talked about the last session of our Theology Roundtable on Friday night was that we have a choice about how we perceive time. We can think that time is just that sort of monolithic element that runs along and kind of keeps things, measures the movement of things or whatever. And a lot of people have a thought about time like that that leads them to believe that time comes up from behind them, that it's a river flowing behind them that's sweeping us along. And I think that adds to the helpless idea of time. It, it adds to the idea that, that there's nothing really we can do about it. There's nothing really, uh, we don't have any choices to, to influence 
it or anything along those lines. Uh, and, and it may be true that it's, it's, it's goofy to think about influencing time a lot, but you know, science talks about all kinds of stuff like that uh, relationship that, of time and relativity. And, and uh, I always think of that movie Interstellar where those guys went down, they were there for an hour and 30 years went by. So the interaction of time eventually ended up saving the planet in that movie. And, you know, I'm not trying to build my theology and doctrine off of uh, Hollywood movies, but if time just sweeps you along from behind, that's why it always feels like you're off balance. Because it's always just coming up and you don't see it. It's coming up and you don't know it. But if time is something that's coming to us, then all of a sudden phrases like the appointed time, they start to make more sense. Because there's a time coming. In that day, Jesus said, that was something that was rushing at the disciples and rushing at us. In that day, you'll know that I'm in my Father and that you're in me and I'm in you. And uh, I think of 1 John, it says, um, little children, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. Do you see how these are events that we participate in in the present or are coming to us at a, at a gift pace from the Lord. Whereas if we think about time just pushing along from behind us like we're in a river, there, there's, there's always a sense of vulnerability. There's always a sense of confusion about that, I think. So I think that's one of the, the things about it. And I do think, in spite of understanding what they said in the Baker Theological Dictionary, I think that we do have enough scripture to formulate our approach to time, our thoughts about time, or perhaps our doctrine of time. Uh, and, and it's because time comes from God, from the Father, through Jesus Christ. So time, you know, me joking about Mick Jagger and being a prophet and Rolling Stones saying that thing, that's not just a joke. There's a reality that time is actually on our side. If there are promises that haven't been fulfilled in our lives, we ought to be thankful for time because there's time for them to be fulfilled. If we didn't have people in our life that don't yet know the Lord, or people in our lives that we have unresolved conflicts with, well, you know, if it weren't for time, how could we ever fulfill that thing? If you know a brother has an offense against you, go to him. You know, lay down your, your gift at worship and go to him. So th there's a ton of things. Life's, life consists of more than just what we've already accomplished. And I'm thankful for that, for one. Life consists of the opportunities that are set before us. And that whole concept of being set before us is time. And if in fact, which I do think it's true, if in fact that time carries with it the very nature of God and the heart of God and the very mission and purpose of Jesus, then all of a sudden I'm kind of excited about what the future holds. I don't, I'm not worried about it. I don't feel like I'm behind the eight ball on time. I don't feel like I'm running out of time. And uh, I certainly don't feel afraid of it anymore. So I have a feeling this kind of thing is why the Lord wants us to look at it. When we looked at the idea of our heart and realized that a lot of us take uh, a kind of an extended, I'm not going to call it a mistranslation, I'm just calling it an extended translation there in Jeremiah 17, 9, that our heart is desperately wicked. If we make that the quintessential definition of our heart, then we're certainly not going to trust the voices that come from it. So I think that mistake in our thinking has been sown into the culture against us, and even into the church culture and biblical culture against us, trusting the voice of the Lord that is going to come in part from inside our heart, because that's where the Holy Spirit lives, that's where Jesus lives, that's where Jesus says that he and the Father are going to take up their abode. In the wrath situation, we isolate wrath as just God's uh, final sort of displeasure and, and judgment against evil. Then when the Lord is trying to lean against us, say, go, don't go that way. Go this way. Don't get comfortable with that in your life. Let's, let's, let's deal with that. We have a tendency to separate from him. And then if it finally breaks through in a, in a more aggressive way, we have a tendency to fear and be turned into a person who, who's afraid of the hand of their father because they never know when he's going to whack them. So uh, I think time's the same, same way. When I thought of time as this kind of impersonal force, and then as I got a little bit older and there were unrealized promises or unrealized goals, uh, it began to make me nervous. And it began to make me fearful that 
Lord, and, and then all of a sudden questions opened up in my mind. So I'm like, what have I done? What have I wasted? You know, have I wasted time? And uh, I'm not saying it's not possible for us to procrastinate. And I don't think that's good. And I'm not saying it's not possible for us to, to get distracted and, and uh, do spend our time, the portion of the of time that we have as, as less valuable. But, you know, maybe having a different view about time would change the way we want to spend it. If I know, and I, I, I'm convinced of it just from this one verse or two verses in Hebrews, if I know that time belongs and came from and carries the characteristics of the God that I love and the Jesus that I love and is my friend and that lives in my heart, then I'm going to be less inclined to blow it off. It's not important. Less inclined. But I'm also going to be inclined to, to be okay with time where you can just kick back. So I was in worship today. Let me tell you this little story. It's fun. This church is pretty intense. And they love people. And they love God. And uh, and so worship was pretty intense. And Mark, I heard that I that we started at 952. So he sat there and actually tracked time and kept egging the worship team on so that it would work for me to come up and yell at you through the phone. And, and did you guys see that? Did it? Was I able to be on? Did you, okay, cool. Awesome. So anyhow... We're there in time, and he just says, go ahead and use your imagination. Picture Jesus, you know, and, and this is something they're going through, uh, and, and he's releasing in his congregation. And it, like I say, it was a really intense, intense time, and I was I was thinking about God on the throne. I was thinking about Jesus as big, king of kings, all that kind of stuff. And when, as soon as I allowed myself to kind of close my eyes and, and uh, let Jesus reveal himself to me, how he's relating to me that day, he was standing in front of me dancing, and he was... He was doing this kind of stuff, and it was it was pretty cool. I mean, and I look like a spaz when I dance, but he just kept encouraging me. Look, just do what I'm doing. And so I started. I did not know what the people at the table behind me thought, but uh, I was doing these little kind of things. And Lila, you'd have been proud of me. I was Im imitating some of your moves. <laughs> but here's the revelation that I have out of this. If that. If, that, if time comes as a part of that redemptive mission and the love of God, then there's time for that too. Of course, the world is lost, and we need to be serious about going out. But there's time for joy. There's time for laughter. There's time for rest. Just a little bit later in Hebrews, in chapter 3 and 4, it talks about entering into his rest. How could rest in a world that was lost and hurting, how could rest be appropriate use of time? Except that time identified with, carried with it the heart of God and the mission and purpose of Jesus. And so anyway, it was pretty cool. That's what I saw. So let me jump back to the screen because I want to get into just a couple other verses. And let me tell you, if I sound a little hesitant reading, here's what's happening. I've got a, a, a list of you guys uh, that are on Zoom and the camera here that I'm looking at with you. <clears throat> on one side of my PowerPoint, but I didn't think about that when I built the PowerPoint, so the ends of all the sentences are cut off. <laughs> so I'm having to remember what the words are that are behind the picture of you guys. So let me uh, go ahead and share, I, and I wouldn't want to lose touch of it, but uh, let's see. All right, so here's our definitions. Now here's some scriptures that give us permission to explore this view of time. So Hebrews 7, 23 and 25, and I think this is the New American Standard. It says, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. And here's the therefore that uh, I want you to think about it as far as time. And I think this reveals to us that time is really a big part of the redemptive plan that the Father is executing through the Son that he gave Jesus to, to us for. Uh, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. So just think about verse 25. Um, he is able to save forever those who draw near to him, near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So let me uh, go one, one more thing. I, I put this in Young's Literal, 
Uh, and I'll just read it to you, and then we'll, I'll switch back and talk to you. And those indeed are many who have become priests because by death they were hindered from remaining. And he, because of his remaining, to the age. That's the Young's translated. This is another one of those verses that has aeon in it. Young's translated to the age. Hath the priesthood not transient. When also he is able to save to the very end. Another reference to, to time and why we're not to be afraid of it. He is able to save to the very end those coming through him unto God, ever living to make intercession for them. All right, so let's think about that a second. Let me get out of the shared mode here. So in this, in this passage of Scripture, it reveals that Jesus is constantly working in time as a priest to save us. In other words, in one sense, time was an enemy of the intercession of the priesthood and the work of the priesthood and, and because guys were dying. But then God overcame that through Jesus. And that's why I think the significance of the fact that time was made by God through Jesus changes everything in our lives. Now, I don't want to project what it means to that he's able to save to the end those who come. I, it's just not where I'm going right now. We'll talk about it when the time's right. <laughs> no pun intended. But, and we have plenty of time to discuss it. No pun intended. <laughs> so, but the point is, is that the redemptive plan is available to you and me and to people we know tomorrow because of time. And it's available later. Or we can say, wow, I've got, a, I've got an, an, an uncle who's nearing death. Well, time is available. Time makes it available. It's an ally to him. And we're saved forever. We're saved all the way into the age. It just changes the fact that, that time is not something trying to cut us off. Time is something that is lifting us forward into the redemptive plan of God. Does that make any sense? It's just a way of, of, of changing the way you think. Let's go back to, let's go to the next one here. got to get more efficient at this, I can tell. Okay, so here's another one. This is in Hebrews chapter 10. And I just stayed in Hebrews. There's really stuff like this all over the New Testament. But every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So this was the other side of the problem uh, back then. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. All right, that's a big verse. Perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So here's how I think about that and how I want to encourage you guys to think about it in relationship to time. Time being produced through Jesus and sharing his redemptive purposes was sort of the arena in which he could offer up himself that created not just a temporal, temporary reprieve from our sin, but a forever reprieve from our sin. Now, I don't fully understand how that always works and everything, but I know this, that if we were only saved in accordance with the moment-by-moment -moment responses that we had to receive blessing, we would be in a very vulnerable position. But because we have the opportunity to reach out and to receive something that time embraced, the, age, the ages, all of them embraced, the scriptures can teach us that we are sanctified forever, we're saved forever. So any sense of insecurity, any sense that something's going to come our way in time to surprise us and take that away, I think we can dismiss, and I think we can assure people that they don't need to worry about that. Because the time was coming out of God through Jesus, and it carries with it both his, the love that motivated him in the first place to redeem us, and it carries with it the, uh, the purposes of Jesus. So that was the one that struck me big. Time adds security to the forever aspect of what Jesus did. Does that make sense? A little bit? You have to wave. No. Thumbs up. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> you look good, too, man. You growing that beard back? <laughs> All right, let me get out of it. Let me share just a little bit. We'll go to the next one. 
And I didn't try to make this too long today, because I didn't know how it was going to work. Vicky was a little worried that it wouldn't work at all. I think we're doing a little bit better than that, hopefully. <coughs> I shared her concerns a tiny bit. All right. Here's a fun bone description. All right. What's fun about this? Hebrews 11.3. This is in the New American Standard. This, uh, this is a verse uh, I think a lot of you guys are familiar with. I like it. We use it a lot to teach about faith, you know. Uh, following this just shortly, as he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he uh, is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But Hebrews 3.11 in the New American Standard says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. So I'm going to let the slide talk to you for a second. What do you think? Is that aeon or cosmos? Because if it's cosmos, it should be translated world. By faith, we understand that the world's prepared by the word of God. But if it's aeon, why is it not translated age? By faith, we understand that the ages were prepared by the word of God. All right? They don't try to switch it around. It is by the ages. By faith we understand that the ages, the ages to have been prepared by the saying of God in regard to these things, seen not having coming out of the things appearing. The ages were created. They were spoken into existence. It's a strong reinforcement of Hebrews 1, found in a verse that, that uh, all my life I, I thought that only referred to the cosmos until I looked it up. So, I believe that time really has been prepared to bring us life, salvation, and relationship with God through Jesus. I don't think that time is the big enemy that we're racing against. I think that it is, uh, I think that time is on our side because it carries with it the very heart of God, the love of God. And from the beginning, think about this. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of, of uh, energy in Christianity these days that for years has battled against the idea that we're just evolved out of monkeys or even worse we're kind of um, brought up in uh, out of ooze and stuff like that what this says is that all that stuff that we're talking about back in the beginning when it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then he made man all of that has, carries the same sort of intent the same sort of purpose that time does. There's something about time that's made in God's image as well because it flows out of him. You know, Romans 1 says that the, all creation declares the glory of God. That means when you look at a sunset, and we know this up here, the trees, we see God in that. We can learn about it. Our heart can be stirred. Questions can be raised in us by the beauty of the, the world around us or by the ferocity of nature or by the... Uh, the, the, the hidden things that you, you dive into with a telescope or with a microscope. There's more going on when we look at nature. Time's the same way. There's more going on in time. Like the thing that's frustrating the heck out of you right now might very well be the mercy of God being manifest in, in a promise being delayed or in time waiting. And once we can change this, then time stops being that impersonal sort of impermeable barrier or that impersonal uh, runway that is going to just lead us to disaster if we're not lucky and maybe to good fortune if we are. But I've never spent my emotions and my energy thinking of time and immediately associating it with God. But I'm beginning to now, and I think that's why he wants us to rethink how we think about time to find our voice. Yeah, Vicki, go ahead. Okay. So um, the scripture that says this, this too will pass, um, I'm kind of relating that to time right now because I mean a lot of people have you know loved ones they've lost and things like that over in a grieving process or whatever but one of the things that I know that is, has really helped me in understanding that time is like on my side <laughs> there's that song again um, is the fact that that thing will pass like it can pass in like moments like, when I get annoyed at somebody, if I will just keep my mouth shut for 15 seconds, right, that will pass. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, time really is 
on our side if we will acknowledge that time's on our side. But when we decide that time isn't on our side, that we've got to blurt that thing out, or we've got to, you know, make sure we're expressing ourselves in a situation, or, uh, you know, whatever, then then it, it almost feels like time isn't on our side in that right. in that case. And so, you know, I think that that as we find our voice in time, part of that is actually making sure that our voice is silent in enough of that moment so that we're not just blurting something out. I don't care if it's a positive thing or a negative thing. A lot of times I'll get things prophetically that I want to say and the Lord says, not now. You know, because time is on my side. That word will go out when he says it's to go out. And so I just, you know, it's just kind of fascinating flipping all of that in our hearts to be able to go, wow, time really is on our side if we give time, time. Right. right. Keep the mic there for a second. Here's something I want, that, a point that just popped out of my, popped out to me out of what you just said, sweetie, was, <laughs> what's the nature of waiting? What's the nature of silence? What's the nature of not responding, of not speaking? Now, I, I know that we're in a series to find our voice, but finding our voice doesn't mean we have to constantly chatter. Finding our voice means that we can also be led to pick our spots a little bit. Yeah. And so if if uh, if time is just, is just this big, nothing, uh, impersonal, I don't know how to, again, I don't know how to, if time doesn't have any characteristics that, that are a part of it, then if we don't respond, it's like wasted time. Or if we wait, we don't have any idea that good could come out of that waiting. But if we know that time was literally birthed out of the nature of God and through Christ who is wholly given to us to redeem stuff, then waiting can be a redemptive act. Patience has a place, if a good place, in love if time has these characteristics. So, yeah, I thought that was a brilliant point. You don't have to panic. You don't have to make something happen in that sense. Is that what you're talking about, Kathy? Sure. No? Yes? Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> time has characteristics. Is that good, honey? <laughs> All right, anybody else have a question? Oh, on Zoom does. And somebody on Everybody. Zoom does. Yeah, I was, I was thinking this morning for some reason on this issue and how, um, you know, Jesus came. One thing they do is to alleviate us from the fear of death. And I think that's really hooked into time mm -hmm. because Ooh. it really, yeah. you know, we see this thing approaching and we're trying to jam a bunch of stuff in and, you know, where it's without, it's, there's a lot of futility and, uh. But if we can change our perspective, because death makes time an enemy, is what I'm trying to say. But really, if it's an LA, death and time are separate. And God has a different perspective on it. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. One of the things that came out, you know, Harold uh, goes all around the world and stuff. And he was trying to talk to us about the fact that death is viewed more horribly and more as an enemy in our culture than it is a lot of places around the world because you know they're confronted with death a lot more but I think this is a powerful thing and, and it's like um, that scripture you know it's a point for man wants to die and end the judgment if times doesn't carry these characteristics of redemption and opportunity and so on then that scripture is is frightening and plays right into the hands of those who through fear of death have been uh, you know, subject to slavery their whole life. Hey, uh, Riley, Jim Jones has raised his hand. See if you can get Jim up so I can hear his question. Yeah. Hey, Pastor, something occurred to me. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Something occurred to me while you are talking. I don't know if this is relevant to what you're discussing, but in the Old Testament, the Israelites were in a battle, and God stopped the sun, gave them more time. He suspended time for a period. Absolutely. Is that relevant to what we're talking about here? I think so. I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's why, uh, I mean, if nothing else, that shows that time is, is submitted and can be used as an ally or even a weapon against evil, you know what I mean? Or more probably accurately, God is very free and willing to use time as an ally 
as a tool to bless, as a tool to aid his people. Um, you know, so, I, yeah, I think that's perfectly relevant, um, as opposed to it being just the consequence of, of the, the measurement of two moving parts in creation. And see, here's another thing, too. This stuff's always been in the Bible. Uh, we, I, we're not finding anything new. I, I looked up a, a word that was translated world and should be ages a couple times, but it's always been in the Bible. And so this isn't a new concept. This is not new to God. It's kind of new to us because we've been sort of tweaked with it a little bit. So somebody else have the ball? But yeah, Jim, I think that's totally relevant. Tommy, Tommy needs the ball. How come you? Oh, who, who's Tommy. catching me there? Okay, here. Can you hear me? Okay. I, uh, I can. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, hi, hi, Tommy. You were behind. You're one of the. Uh, you guys are one of the ones behind that little row of Zoom pictures over there. Yeah, I can see you. Really okay. <laughs> um, I was behind in time to get to work one day, and uh, as I was trying to hurry, 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 I realized that the Lord was saying. In you, I mean, in me, you live and you move and you have your being. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you're outside of time, then can you fix this? Because <laughs> I'm going to be late. And so I took a deep breath and said, I'm just going to relax. Because if I'm in you and, and in you I move, which is a time thing, then mm -hmm. um, fix it. And so he did. I don't know how he did, but I got to work on time. And and I thought about I thought about that, and I told a friend of mine about that, and he actually did that same thing. He was late for a meeting, and he said, "Oh, I remember. I am in you, and in you I move and live and have my being. So I'm going to relax with this time thing and just ask you to fix it." And it actually happened with him, too. Wow. And he was able to get there, quote, on, on, time. on time. And on time. so I think that has meant a lot. Well, that has meant a lot to me in, in that framework that when I get panicky, which I've been doing a little bit about retirement and different kinds of time issues, I'm heading yeah. toward this, this thing, and... Um, and it means a lot to me instead of uh, heading toward it in fear and trepidation, I can head toward it in expectancy and hopefulness. Well, that's, and that's, that's really, yeah. and that's, that's sort of given me a different perspective as of about two minutes ago when you were mentioning that. And I, I just wrote it down and I went, oh, this can apply to that whole fear of retirement thing, you know? Yeah. Because instead of just thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And all that kind of thing, I can look at it as an expectancy that time is coming toward me with opportunities. That's right. That more and more That's opportunities right. and His love is coming toward me in this season of life rather than I'm going toward it feeling like I'm a runaway train fixing to hit yeah. the end, end of the bridge. So. See, I think this is a beautifully stated emotional center to this thing. Uh, and then you go back when when uh, when God says that the uh, children of Israel didn't mix um, belief, faith in their hearts for this thing. They had a, an evil, unbelieving heart. Sonny and I have talked about this a lot. Almost always, when that word evil is used, it, it has to do with a work-related thing, a toil-related thing. Um, the byproduct of the independence that Adam and Eve uh, struck out into in the garden. That byproduct was toil. Uh, birth became labor. And the, the land yielding, the harvest became plowing. And uh, the normal situation between seed time and harvest, the Bible said, is going to be closed at some point. And it says death is going to be no more because a lot in a lot of our minds, death marks the end. But death is death can't be the end. Because death isn't even going to keep existing forever. You know, it has no place in time eventually. So I, th I think uh, both the, the security that Vicki was talking about to, to the, let things have some time. Because in letting something have time to work, 
by resting and, and by withholding premature talking or whatever, you are, you are declaring your trust in those characteristics that time has as coming from God. And then Tommy, that's a, that ministers to me and Vic, I'm sure, as we're sitting there, because uh, we could certainly look at that view of uh, toward retirement or whatever, or ministry or destiny or calling. It almost doesn't matter. If time is that wave that's pushing you forward, there's no, no way to not feel out of control about it. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, and, and God showed, for instance, you know, what Jim brought up, that he made the sun stand still, or he made it back up on the steps for Hezekiah, sun stand still when Joshua was fighting the Valley of Achor, that, that God's eager to use time that way. God's eager to use time that way. Um, if, we, if we can rest better, rest is, is a physical manifestation of trust, and trust is the nature of faith. So he who comes to God, you know, must believe that he is and reward him because he has to have faith. Faith is trust. It's the spiritual thing behind trust. And rest is the manifestation of trust. When we don't have a particular job to do. And so can doing things. I mean, that can be obedience. But yeah, that's, that's powerful. Um, and why would we think God would be any less inclined to do a miracle with time than he is a miracle with physical things? Tim. Yes, um, this is really good. I'm enjoying this a lot. But my perspective changed on time when we got into some readings about how the Hebrews view time. And it's circular, and we've talked about this once before. Mm -hmm. It's not linear. If we, if we keep looking at time as linear in our age and our lifetime is linear, then there's this stage and this stage and this stage and then death, you know. But the Hebrews have a, a different way of looking at it. They look at it as mm -hmm. circular. Every end has a new beginning. Every beginning will have an end. But it's all the circle of life. And I'm thinking... That's so true. I mean, even as Christians, we believe that, right? When we do. We die, yeah. It's not the end. It's yeah. just a new beginning. And for Tommy, when I retired, you know, you have these things like, oh, you know, life is going to be different. Well, life is wonderful, by the way, when you retire. <laughs> and you just find new things to do and new challenges. And I chose to just call it Chapter 2. And I know there'll be many more chapters, but... That's what retirement was for me. It was an end of the work life as I knew it, but a new beginning and a new challenge. So, yeah, that's awesome. You know, and, and, and there's a couple things that reinforce that idea. I do think one of the casualties in a positive sense to us rethinking time is going to be thinking of it in a linear way like that. Um, culturally, philosophically, artistically, musically, time is is often spoken of as circular, not linear, most of the time. In fact, I can't even think of a song where time is linear because it doesn't, it doesn't represent anything like hope for things being redeemed or, you know, like the circle of life from uh, Lion King. Um, just all that way. And then science also seems to say that time is not best understood linearly. Uh, the whole theory of relativity causes time to bend and that in, in the bending of time produces a return. It produces a circular thing. Or like I say, the way people are trying to uh, deal with time in relationship to black holes and physics and quantum physics and stuff, uh, those illustrations that time slows down when you get near an event horizon. Um, since time was made by God through Jesus, I've been allowing myself permission. And that's, I want to reflect back on what you said, Tommy. Uh, if we'll think about these things, we'll have permission to think about other things differently, like security, retirement, peace, like how to win an argument. What if time's part of winning an argument? What if time is part of being vindicated if you're wrong? You know, what if time in the form of patience, and patience is the first quality of love, and love is who God is, and time came from God. I just see all these things beginning to be connected a lot. And then the same thing goes with what Sonny mentioned about being enslaved through the fear of death. 
What if time brings all those characteristics of love to bear on that, uh, to be one of the aspects of God's nature and personality that actually uh, delivers us from that, you know, or that Jesus uses to deliver? So anyway, I started thinking of Jesus, since time comes through Jesus, what if I, what's going to happen in my head if I start thinking of Jesus like the event horizon at a black hole? The closer we get to Jesus, the more time slows down and the more capable we are of taking advantage of the opportunities it brings. I don't know if that's true or not. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about questions. You don't have to be right to ask a question. You just have to be free. <laughs> and the answer can be no, and it's still okay. But I've had some fun thinking about that. I've had some fun thinking about that. Uh, anybody else got a got a thought or a question? Uh, Tim? Hi, Larry. Uh, I did not ask my question last week, and okay. and because I did not, I thought it was gone forever because that moment in time had passed. And <laughs> That's brilliant. Seriously, that is so a perfect illustration. <laughs> But I realized when when Tommy was sharing, um, the, and well, you first put Hebrews eleven three up, and while Tommy was sharing, I said, "Well, no, I'm I'm going to do it now. I'm going to say, uh, just like it says in Hebrews eleven one, uh, Tommy had to mix that with faith, and Hebrews eleven one says that now faith is, and whether you read that yesterday or tomorrow or today." It's always now faith is. Yeah, yeah. Faith That's really true. And That's just really all true. of a sudden uh, had an aha that faith and time are also connected. Yeah. They are. You know, there's even some language, Tim. I didn't have time to get into it this week, but I mentioned last week. Uh, there's this, this phrase of, of epi noon, and it means right now coming out of God, right now coming out of God, right now coming, coming, coming. And uh, you're right, but seriously, guys, I want you to, to r let rum around in your heart and your head what he said. I thought that moment was gone, yeah. but what if that moment's not gone? And there's a lot of scripture that gets a different kind of light on it if we don't think of time as a linear thing where it passes. Abraham uh, longed for my day, and he saw it uh, at the appointed time. Uh, you know, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I don't fully understand how it is, but I know it's not a big yardstick or a string stretched out with just the years on it going along in a line. It's much more embracing. It's much more wrapping up. Well, let me see here. I mean, take a quick check. I, I think that was my last slide, so I'm going to jump over here and get impersonal for a second. Give that a try. Um, oh, no, here it goes. Don't be afraid or intimidated by time. Tommy's testimony was perfect for it. And then the, the larger, or not to say larger, but perhaps the more psychological implications is kind of what Sonny brought up. Um, fear of death is, is tucked into time. And our need, to, our need to preach the gospel as if a person was going to get hit by a bus on the way home. It, it just robs the gospel of love qualities of patience and the ability to ask questions. Time flows from the love and nature of your Father. Time comes to us through Jesus and is about his mission to include, forgive us, redeem us, and save us, sozo, and heal us. And so I would say that that old phrase about time heals all wounds. For a saved person, time does. There's no question about it. It provides, and I think uh, uh, Matt and Chris are up at a retreat this weekend. But one of the things that Matt took away from last week was um, the thought that I said, time is like a hothouse to let the seeds of God's promise and purpose and life in us mature. And uh, I, I don't know, you know what we're going to think of time like. I, I agree it'll be circular in some sense. I agree it won't be linear only in some sense. But is it an arena? Is it, a, is it a, a, an atmosphere? Or is it thought of in some other way like that? And so I guess time really has uh, been designed to heal our wounds and set our hearts and minds free to give permission to do just that. I want us to do that. So let me get back out here so I can see you before we close and I say goodbye. So uh, praise God. How'd this work? Did it go okay? Good. Very good. You guys are pretty good. I mean, 
I didn't see anybody nodding off. Or, and I've seen a couple of you do that while I was standing there in person. So that's my yeah. Yeah. I do have a, a number of guys that we're going to uh, hook up with in the not too distant future. There's one young guy named Eric Reeder. Vicky was in a class of his uh, when we were out here in Pennsylvania last time. He lives down in um, West Virginia, I think. But he was very excited. I got to spend some time with him and absolutely love him. There's another uh, young man named Jake that pastors a church in Tennessee. He went to Karis Bible College and uh, had a wonderful time with him. He's going to be on screen at some point. And uh, I, I think I can get Mark to do more than just pop his head in and say hi. These guys are super gracious. But uh, I appreciate this, guys. I appreciate uh, what we're doing. There were some prophetic things spoken that weren't just a reaction to knowledge uh, about what God's doing with us and, and, and how he's going to connect us around the world and begin to shift some atmospheres and stuff. So I appreciate it. Uh, what's the weather like there? Is it snowing or is it nice? nice. Cold. It's cold. Cold and sunny. Cold. cold. Is the heater working in the room? Much no, I don't know. I have a jacket on. Okay. <laughs> I was by the front door. So Tim and and uh, Meg have the declaration still to read. Oh, excellent. To good. all of us, so we're gonna let them do that. Also, if you're good with that. I'm totally good with that. And then I, I'd actually like somebody there to close in prayer because uh, it's kind of nice to have flesh and blood doing that there for you. Okay, well, we had a great ascension time this morning. The meeting was wonderful, and guess what? It was a message about peace, rest, and tranquility. And uh, it's perfect for the season, but a reminder that that should be praying for peace around the world at all times, not just at Christmas time. Uh, cool. Hey, Tim, if you'll just step uh, six inches to your right, you'll be able to read the thing behind you. Nope, the other right. That must be your left. <laughs> Sorry. Over toward the screen a little bit. That's perfect right there. Is that good? Okay. So we're going to go through uh, the decrees and declarations this morning that we had here. And we've got one more thing. Um, we, we're going to have Tommy come up and explain some specific prayer for her granddaughter, yeah. Ella. And I know that she can do it uh, eloquently <laughs> as medi in medical terms. So... Uh, we're going to let her do that. And it is important to have your prayers presented specifically and have all of us in agreement with that. So in a little bit, I'll have her come up and share that also. Hey, Tim, Tim, every time you touch that, it oh. stops doing okay. the sound. So you, can... you know, it's my New England. I'm, I yeah, use I my hands a lot. I'll try to, <laughs> try to hold firm you. here. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go through the decrees and declarations. Like I said, it was a wonderful time. We got on a, a plane this morning called Shalom. And uh, Jesus took us into the, the planets and he gave us peace wherever we went. And we specifically focused on the earth. And, uh, and it, it was beautiful. And he just showed us, you know, the places on earth that we should be praying for, especially places like China and the Middle East right now, but certainly in our own government. So it, it was it was great, and uh, we took the time to do that, and it was a great trip with uh, Captain Jesus. He was pilot today. <laughs> so let's go through the decrees and declarations. Father, we decree and we declare. Father, we decree and we declare that the glory and the majesty of the universe. That the glory and the majesty of the universe has no man understood or seen. It is within you. It is within you. Father, we decree and we declare. We decree and we declare. We have experienced part of that glory and majesty. We have experienced part of that glory and majesty. Of the Lord, and it is within us. Of the Lord, and it is within us. We released it on the earth. We released it on the earth. Father, we decree and we declare. Father, we decree and we declare. You are opening wide the eyes of our spirit. You are opening wide the eyes of our spirit. You instructed us to behold. You instructed us to behold. We decree and we declare. We decree and we declare. 
Peace on the earth as it is in heaven. Peace on earth as it is in heaven. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Amen. Okay, Amen. now, Tommy, you want to come up and share? We're excited about what God's going to do here. Before Tommy shares, I just want to tell you, God answers prayer. You know, I myself was delivered from death. Meg had a, a life uh, encompassing experience a number of years back. God came to her rescue and healed her. I have a friend, a, a good friend of ours that stood up for us when we got married, Ted, and he's been delivered from pancreatic cancer. We have a niece at stage four breast cancer. She's been delivered from cancer. We have another friend in, in uh, Arizona who had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's a single dad. And he needs to be around. <laughs> You're smacking it. You're smacking it. <laughs> oh, I'm smacking it. I'm sorry. I'm not hearing that. Uh, so he's been delivered from cancer. He had stem cell transplant and, and no longer has cancer. I mean, God answers prayers. We had somebody from our church here, Matt, who was delivered from thyroid cancer. And he's been delivered. I mean... God is at work, folks. Mm -hmm. We just need to increase our faith, right? And just mm -hmm. believe. And that's what we're going to believe right now mm -hmm. as Tommy shares about her granddaughter, Ella. Okay. I also have... Ex Thank you. <laughs> I, also, I also was miraculously healed by the Lord in one day of multiple chemical sensitivities where I could not go into stores mm -hmm. or work. And um, God miraculously healed me to the point where I can actually sit in a room with Clorox. Wow. 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 And that was amazing. That was amazing because it was causing me many, many problems. Um, my granddaughter, Ella, who is six years old, she lives in Arlington, Virginia, with my son and wife and uh, his three other children. Uh, she was diagnosed last week with uh, an aortic stricture and um, an aortic valve that does not function. Mm -hmm. And so I started out, she's going to have a procedure Thursday to open up that aortic stricture. Um, and so I was asking people to pray that she would get through the, the procedure well and that she had a cold and that she would get over that and that I slipped on the ice and fell and hurt my back and that I could fly and blah, blah. And so uh, the other night I was walking into the room and the Lord really spoke to me and he said, you just lowballed me. And I asked him, what do you mean? And he said, why don't you ask her for, for a complete healing for this child? And I said, yeah, I guess I did lowball you. And he said, it was because you were afraid that I wouldn't come through. And how would that look if it didn't come in a timely fashion? And how would, you know, you can just kind of fill in the blank while we don't ask God to do the big things that he knows and that we know he can do. So I said, fine, I'll do that. So I am asking you for to be in agreement with me that Ella's aorta will be supernaturally healed. And it will, when they go in, I asked the Lord to give me a picture. And when they first did the scans, it shows the aorta is constricted and that the valve is malfunctioning. And so then I, I said, well, give me a picture. And he said, so right next to that picture of the problem was a picture of them going in and seeing that the aorta is completely open and the valve is completely fixed. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking for agreement that as it is in heaven, shall it be on the earth yes. in Ella's aorta. Amen. That yes. the aorta is completely <coughs> open and there's no stricture. That the aortic valve is completely healed. And that any complications that were caused by this stricture systemically in her body will be completely and totally eradicated. Amen. Amen. Yes. I'm asking for agreement in that. And yes. that's, that's where I'm standing. Amen. Amen. And I just thank you, Lord. He just said, just rejoice. And I'm sorry, I'm just rejoice <laughs> And if you agree, raise your hand. Yes, we agree. We agree. And we decree and we declare that where two or more has touched this, it shall be done, and it is done. Now is that time. 
Amen. 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 Hey, Tim, before you, uh, let me see, before you, you close, could you go in there? I think it's on the wall right outside my office. Is that paper with our values on it? Oh. And would you go get that and read or have somebody read that risk-taking value? Sure. All right, Meg's going to go get it. Or have somebody go get it. And then Meg's, Meg's getting it now. Okay, excellent. Hey, Tim. We can even interact Tim. a little bit. I can Tim. be bossy over this thing. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, can you, can you, can you uh, speak? Praise God. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments, open. questions for Pastor? When are you coming back, questions? by the way? Uh, I'll be back to, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We're, we can't wait to hear all the good stuff you've been uh, learning. It really has been spectacular. It really yeah. has. Yeah. yeah. Very spectacular. Hey, Pastor. <clears throat> Pastor. Yes. Oh. Hey, Jim here. I just wanted uh -huh. to give you a report. I'm at home right now uh, Zooming, and I can see you clearly. I can hear clearly every word you well. I see the bottom. I can expand it and see everyone who's attending, either a picture or their name. So it's yeah. really quite effective. You're a very impressive way to work. Good. That's a great report, Jim, because there's there's people I know that we need to connect with. Okay, so that, that's not the one sheet. That's the one about our values. Where's the oh, which where's one? the one, you know, that we got the final values written out on? Oh, I think it's actually in there in on the wall in where they zoom. Oh, okay. We have multiple okay, sorry, sheets. <laughs> We're having Meg be Vanna White. <laughs> Vanna White. That was us doing our doing our math in between. Yeah, that's a good report, Jim. I'm glad because there's, and, and we've got a few tools coming that are going to make it a little bit, a little bit uh, better still. I was so honored when I came back here. One of the first things that Mark Gurniak said is he said, "Larry, I think I've caught all your services," and I mean that's quite a statement for a pastor who's got the kind of busy life. All right. On her. But uh, it, it it opened the door for some conversations about the things we've been considering, and it's just it's just really really encouraging. So God's God's doing some stuff here. Listen, if, uh, if if Meg can't find that, it, it had to do with something oh, about here being it is. takers. Oh, there We're it is. Here. Oh, we have it now. All right. There you so. go. All right. So, <laughs> you know, we, we raised our hand in agreement Perfect. over this thing. All and right. I think one of the very precious things that Tommy shared with us was that she heard the Lord encourage her to not lowball him and to not, um, anyway, go ahead and just one time read through that, that value about uh, taking risks that we came up with at, our, at that elders retreat. Okay. Uh, when we go through the whole chart here? No, just the no, taking just the risks. One, I, there's one about... Oh, taking uh, risks? Yeah, taking yeah. risks. Yeah. Okay. In spite of fear, we are jump the canyon risk takers. We will never dishonor God with small thinking or lackluster goals. All right. So All right. that's a value that we hold. And Tommy just walked that out brilliantly, right? Praise God. Amen. Amen. So we are uh, jump the canyon risk takers and will never dishonor God with small thinking or lackluster goals. So yes, Lord, we come into agreement with yes. Ella and her full healing, full healing to the glory of God, to all the doctors and everything. You don't have to prove yourself to us, Lord. We know you love us. We know you love Ella. We just want to give you the opportunity through our belief and our faith to do mighty works on the earth so that men may know that you love them. Amen. 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 All right. All right, well, somebody go ahead and close, and I'm going to give Mark his office back and write this off as a success. Jim, again, thanks for that report, because how this looks out there. Paul, I want to bless you. Maria, bless you. I don't know who Pro Board is, but whoever you are, we love you. <laughs> yeah. And bless you, and Robin, good to see you. God bless oh. That's us. You guys keep praying for Nancy, too. I think she's polishing up her uh, retreat back in uh, Missouri. And I'll look forward to hearing all the amazing things that come out of that. So I'll shut up. You guys can close, and we'll, we'll, we'll get out of here. All right. Somebody like to close? Thanks, Larry. Okay. I'll close it. Well, we just thank you. We thank you for this time together. We just thank you that I won't keep bouncing the ball here. We just thank you, Lord, that you uh, just bless this message today. We're encouraged, Father God, that we're all in your time frame. That Jesus really is the source of our time. And he's our focus. I thank you, Father God, that we truly are in a circle of life and excited about every part of it. We thank you, dear Jesus, that you just 
bless us right now with, with peace, tranquility in our lives, that we take time to rest in you. And this is a time, a lot of times, uh, and for a lot of people, that it's hurry up and stress and shopping and this and that. And I just love the expression that Jesus is the reason for the season. And he truly is. I just thank you that we can all take time out this week to spend time with him and time with you. And just to acknowledge your blessings in our lives. Your healing. Uh, healing in every area of our life. Whether it be in our spiritual, mental, physical, financial. That Jesus is the answer. And we thank you for that, dear Lord. We just thank you that you blessed Larry with this trip and the interaction that he had with other pastors and teachers back there, and that you just blessed that time, and, and that you gave him great input, and you gave him time to share with them, too, with his output. Thank you that you give us all a voice, Lord, that we yes, should sir. share, Father God, all the miracles that are happening in our lives. Yes, sir. It's an encouragement. It's a faith builder, and we thank you for that. We just thank you for everyone here and your extended families, that you're blessed, that you can be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Tim. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic day. Uh, keep an eye out. If you're at Pikes Perker, I'll give you a text to let you know what happens as far as up my travels tomorrow, whether we're going to have it. Um, bless you guys. Bless Bye -bye. you. Love you. Bye. All right. Bye, Zoomers. I know. Well, they can see me waving. Bye, Facebookers. <laughs> Thanks, Zoomers. Thanks, Facebook. Share, 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 share. Okay. Oh, we really need to get better at that. <laughs> 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 <laugh